Dan and Kemp, welcome to the Dylan Friends Podcast, my friend. This has been a long time in the making. Absolutely fantastic to be here. We're in the bloke in the bar studios, which might I add is second to none, my friend. So thank you so much for having me. Mate, it's, uh, it's an honour to have you in here. And it's an honour to be sitting on the other side of the, the table. What's also strange is for many months I stalked you on the top podcast list. Um, and I kind of had a sense of knowing you before actually speaking to yeah. you. So I guess this must be how chicks feel when they get stalked on Instagram. You're, yes. you're the chick in this scenario. Yes. And uh, it, might have been, it would have been hard for you and, and easy as well because when you sort of see the charts, Dylan Friends number one, mm. you, you're sort of going past it every day. Yeah, to I don't sort recall of... that happening, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's like I love the fact that you're ambitious. That's, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, we'll cover that to all be today. Fair, though, to be fair, currently number one on Spotify, Spotify is Dylan Friends. Number two is Bloke in a Bar. Spotify is my main one. I, okay. I shoot everyone out there these days okay. because it's, it's actually a good topic in terms of podcasting. And I know a lot of podcasters listen to your show and mine always asking advice mm. there's no right link to do you know i've tried link tree giving them three i think just going hard at one platform is the best so i share everyone spotify apple and android both have it that's mm. the reason i do it a lot of people are so it's good to answer that question yeah it is interesting I, I, to be honest i i just put them both up um because i feel like i don't know i don't want to alienate certain people mm. you know what i mean i don't want people oh fuck, where, where's the apple one because that's just more qu- more headaches for me yeah I, whenever i put something up i'm like what's the least amount of headache with questions that i'm going to get with this <laughs> do you know what i mean like if i put up spotify i guarantee there's 10 messages saying where's the apple one it's yeah. like, bro it's where it's been for the last five years same place um but no you're totally right there is like for example even like even very simple things of like you know who do you use to host your podcast i, I use libsyn i'm not sure if you use them i use wushka Wushka, apparently yeah. they're really good as well where yeah. you can like change ads post um upload so like there is um there is a technical side that seems deep that isn't that deep and i think that's like a hurdle for a lot of people that do want to get into podcasts they think that they go to libsyn for example and they're like what the fuck is going on mm. and they just like give up or whatever yeah um even the setup of all of it, i honestly reckon if you go on youtube just for one day you'll have it sorted and then it's just repeating it youtube is like I, I know you're a big man on YouTube. You love YouTube, but I come from the ilk of I was never a YouTube kid per se. You know how people grow up watching mm. YouTube, yep. and I know it's big in the US. And kids these days absolutely love YouTube. If you have a question, type in "How do I do this?" on YouTube. Crazy. There is like the most in-depth tutorials that mm. you could go to Harvard Uni, mm. and they wouldn't teach it as well. 100%. Anything you want, how to light a room, how to get the best audio, what's the best mic to use. You know, mm. I started my vlog last week. What's the best camera? I watched probably 16 hours worth of vlogging cameras. You want to ask me about vlogging cameras? Oh, no, I'll tell Everything. you. Sony ZV-1, that's the best one. Yeah. Okay, David okay. Dobrik uses it. We got, yeah, we got SV-1, two of them at, at my old studio. They're uh, unbelievable. They're fantastic, and I found it on YouTube. Top 10, you just look up top 10 2021 cameras, you yeah. get your answer. Done. Um, yeah, no, nah, YouTube is, um, it's such a good place. Like, I, I've, I've built computers from YouTube. My whole career is on YouTube pretty much in the sense of like, from the get-go, that's all I did was like how to start a podcast and then it was like what how to hook a podcast audio interface up then it was like how do you edit and it's all there and the b- best thing about YouTube is you can pause it like a lecture you're sitting there and it's just like go and you got to write down notes and then you go back to that note and you're like man I don't even know what that says whereas YouTube you just pause it you put it in practice and then you keep going and the good thing about YouTube even these days is they've even got it broken up you can put the timestamps on it and you can learn each spe- like specific step so Skip. So good, bro. So good. Um, and I think that's why when we get along in our short friendship uh, is the fact that we come from that same milk. You know, we've had a, quite a similar story, um, but also not so similar in terms of, you know, sporting, mm. transitioning out, having passion about, you know, storytelling and, and so many things. But first, what I like to do in my podcast, as you'd know, being a big fan, is I like to talk about how we first met. Mm. So as we said, that was probably through the brink of COVID. We are just on the phone chatting, mm. reaching out. I kid you not, and I said this to you, you emailed me, I reckon, I think it was either late, the last two days of the year or the first two days of the year mm. in 2020, 2021. And I was, I had in my notes, reach out to Den and Camp and really? chat about that podcast. Crazy. Like, cause I was like, look, here's a guy doing the same thing I'm doing mm. in a different sport, in, in, a, in a business that no one really knows what the fuck they're doing, mm. but sort of you can learn off everyone. You know, I, I caught up with the Shameless Girls in Melbourne um, mid that year and it's changed the way I look at it as well mm. and it's just so good that and i think in australia as well we don't utilize each other enough mm. you know you sometimes you look at people you go oh fuck this guy you know he's a competitor but it's mm. not you're actually in the same yeah. um building but in saying that we reached out we had a chat then i came up here a couple of weeks ago yep. um for you know when we finally started to, to to catch up and 
It was it was a tough day for me. <laughs> it, it, it looked was, like a tough day, that's for sure. And I'm apologising now. <laughs> so to give context, you know, Denon and I have obviously got the partnership now with Bloke in a Bar Beer, um, Bloke in a Bar Podcast and Dylan Friends. And pretty big thing that's happened in my life, mm. you know, like big occasion. Yep. And unlike me to try and fuck that up. Okay. <laughs> so I've come up to Sydney on a, on a wheel, 24 hours notice. Yep. Come up. Yep. Perfect. Coming up. We're doing a big media day. And stupidly came up a day early. Probably should just phone up on the day. Came up a day early, caught up with um, a couple of friends mm. and had a few drinks and ended up having a few drinks. And I don't really remember what happened next, but I remember waking up the next day thinking, I've got to go to this shoot to meet Denning Camp today <laughs> and I can't get my head out of the sink. <laughs> I rocked up, was really confident that my act was going to go well, telling yep. you that I had food poisoning. Oh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> I would have believed you. <laughs> I'm a trusting kind of guy. I don't think you would have. <laughs> but it was a it, it was a funny one because it was probably the best way that we probably could have met because mm. uh, both like us with a beer company, rocking yep. up, not being able to yep. really put two words together <laughs> was actually worked quite well. And also like being former athlete, it's kind of like, well, of course you got in the beers with the boys. <laughs> like, of course you went out and nearly ruined your whole life. <laughs> you know, of course this huge opportunity that... It's never come before. Never. <laughs> Let's ruin it. <laughs> Let's just fuck it up. You know, like it's it's almost poetic. It's almost poetic, really. It couldn't have started better. Exactly, because I was like, is he really a sportsman? That's what I was asking myself before <laughs> you rocked up. And when you rocked up with bags hanging down your knees under your eyes <laughs> yep. and smelling of fucking rolled in Jim Beam and fucking whatever else you drank. Logan Bar. Logan Bar, yeah. obviously, because it's, it's at every single pub in the, yep. in the entire yep. world. Um I knew that's the guy I need as a part of the team. And I felt really... That's the guy I want to... Our first big partnership ever as a company, that's the guy I'm going for. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) That doesn't make me feel any better. Um, But no, it was a great day, mate. We had a super day last week launching it and and I think it's gone really well so Mm. far. So we thought, look, let's do a podcast. Um, You've got an incredible story, so I want to get into that today. Mm. Um, The only thing that was a little bit funny as well while we were in here last week was the fact that you sat down and asked me if I had any highlights on YouTube, speaking of YouTube again. And like, I was no, like, yeah, you, I've got, a, I've got a couple of highlights. I kind of felt like you threw no, it No, no, no. Yeah, you said like, yeah, I got, I got, I got a couple of highlights. Obviously, I got a couple of highlights. Maybe but I was drunk because I don't remember you me asking you that. My highlights are in like one minute. There's, there's like 10 <laughs> one minute ones. Okay. You've obviously gone together and collated all yours. So we were watching like a one uh, minute one I of don't mine. I remember that either. And you did an eight minute version of your own highlights <laughs> that I had to watch through the whole time. It's, it's weird how like... <laughs> Memory is different for different people, eh? It's very strange because, like, I recall, and I, I feel like I've got witnesses could back this up, that Dill was the one saying, put me highlights. No. <laughs> have a look at how good I used to be, how good I could have been, talking 300 games, but he didn't feel... Honestly, this, is, this was a chat, really. Could have been a 300 gamer, but I feel like I'm already an MVP at content, so why would I keep doing the footy stuff? That's fair. Um, then the highlights came up, and... I don't know why someone else put on my highlights and, <laughs> and that's the end of the story, really. That's the real reason I've brought this up is I'm flat. <laughs> I want someone to make, collate all my info, all my highlights, <laughs> and I want an eight-minute version instead of just eight like version. them all together. So hopefully we do that. To be fair, that highlights package is, for me has been up for like 14, 15 years, yeah. th- 13 years, which is showing my age. Um, and it's all from one year. So like one year wonder, really, to be honest. It was Pretty good highlights package, mate. <laughs> we'll get into it now. Now, early life, mate, before bloke in a bar, mm. before the, uh, I won't say entrepreneur because I know you don't like that word, mate, you are word today. History. It was sport. Mm. You're a soccer player, mm. Gold Coast. Uh, what's the transition like there? I, 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 so you're playing soccer, just growing up, loving it, and now, you know, fast forward into two, three years later, you're actually lining up with the Broncos in the NRL. Mm. Well, it was, um, it all happened kind of, relatively quickly in the sense that I was lucky that I'd grown up with the same group of mates. So, when, you know, when you grow up, I'm not sure if you did, but I went to primary school and high school with the same mm. group of people. Um, when you grow up with the same group of mates, regardless of what sport you play, they can they can they they know whether you're a good sports person or good at all, whatever. So they were aware that, you know, I was really good at soccer and I was really, uh, you know, a good runner um, for my age. And so I'd gone to nationals and won the nationals for 800 and one state for like sprinting and everything. So I, I, my whole life was sport. Like I still did school. I, my dad was, is a very educated man. So we, I still did school. But at the end of the day, like from five years old up until I quit pretty much, I mean, it still is sport, but 
it, it was all about sport. So regardless of what sport it was in, I was definitely always going to be a professional athlete. Um, but I just never thought I'd be rugby league because even as a youngster, I was like, man, rugby league, it's just brutes running into each other. Um, it's, there's no kind of skill involved. And I was really focused on soccer. It wasn't until grade 12, well, actually grade 11, I was asked to go away to confraternity with the, the year 12 side and, in rugby league. And so the, the funny thing was that I, this is how much I didn't really enjoy it and I just did it because my mates did it. Um, as in like, just because my mates asked. Like, it's not like I played at school 8, 9, 10, 11. Like rugby league wasn't even a, um, wasn't even a subject at our school. You couldn't even do it. Uh, and also my mum and dad wouldn't let me because if I got injured for soccer, because I'd have to go away for nationals or whatever soccer that year. Anyway, so year 11 comes around and that group of mates, they knew I was okay at footy. So they asked me to come and I, I lied and said, um, no, I've got, this was my a thousand ex missus ago. <laughs> no, um, I'm, I've got nationals for soccer. But really, I actually went and saw my ex missus and the confraternity happened to be on the Gold Coast. Anyway, so... I'm walking from her place with her to the ice cream store. A bus <laughs> drives past. <laughs> and it's the confraternity rugby league team that asked me to go. And that I said, no, I can't go. I've got nationals for soccer. And they're like, you're a fucking dog, Kev. Fuck you, Kev, out the window. And I was like, oh, fuck, being sprung. So the next year came around and I couldn't lie again. They, they would be, you know, onto it. But also, like, the next year was my year as well. It wasn't the year up asking me to mm. play. Uh, so what was funny is that... so. My, he was my best mate when we were really young, and then, um, and then he was actually a bit of a bully actually from fucking year six onwards. Um, but he, it was weird. Like he would bully me, and then it, then we would fight, and then he'd bully me, and then we'd fight. Anyway, so it was like a really weird relationship. He was like the cool kid, but he was a massive Broncos fan, and so we were in a, a good phase at this point. Um, and and he basically sat me like we were all sitting at a table and they were asking me to come like and i was like man i got national I, I actually had nationals in two weeks anyway so he goes to me mate i promise you if you go to confraternity the broncos will scout you and this is a diehard broncos fan like he can tell you fucking everything so he knows he's a young he, kid though yeah we well, was we're year 12 at this year 12 point. so what 16 17 yeah and he goes he goes, I promise you. And, and that's where a lot of our issues came from is that he loved sport, but I was the one that was good at it. So mm. every time I'd go away for nationals, he'd come back, he'd get all the boys together to bully me. We'd punch on with him and a few of, of his friends. Then it would simmer down. That's why sometimes violence is the answer. Honestly, <laughs> sometimes violence is the answer. Um, I tell you what, if my kid's getting bullied, I'm telling that guy to, like 100%. Because like, I, I was always taught, turn the other cheek, be good, so good that eventually they'll be nice to you. Um, and so with him, I was always like, I'll just keep being nice, keep being nice. And it never worked until we punched on. And then that would like release the tension. Anyway, he said, um, if you go, I promise you, you will be signed by the Broncos, guarantee it. And I was like, oh man, I guess. And every single other mate around the table um, that was his crew, because um, I didn't really have a crew really, to be honest. It was, as I said, I got fucking bullied all through high school. All his mates like, nah, like, bro, you're really good for us and you're a really good athlete. Like just muck around with us, but you're not as good as the guys that are actually in the systems right now. And they rattled off a few guys like Darius Boyd, Stephen Michaels. They were the biggest guys in Queensland at the time for rugby league. Anyway, so I, I was like, well, I can't even afford to go. So the school actually helped fundraise a bit of money to help us go. Um, we went up there and I, we were in the B comp. So the B comp is like just low. It's all just for fun. It's, there's no high quality. The, the A comp is where you've got guys that are signed to all these different clubs and everything. Anyway, I ended up winning player with the most potential and I was sick at the time when the scout pulled me out and said like you've won this award I was like real crook so I got the award in front of everyone and at that time you weren't allowed to speak to other clubs if you're contracted to a club so he said to me look if you're contracted to another club we'll stop speaking but just so you know play with the most potential you can come to our develop we want you to come the prize was to come to a development camp and the development camp is one underneath the elite camp so the development camp is for like out of 100 kids, maybe one will get pushed into the elite camp. So they won't, won't play in a role, but they get pushed. Anyway, so went to so a few weeks went by. I went to nationals for soccer. Um, and then my dad called the Broncos and said, my son doesn't play rugby league, so we're not sure you know, what you want him to do. And he was like, what do you mean? He doesn't play free school or doesn't play club? He's like, no, no, he, he's a soccer player. Like he just went to nationals for soccer. And so they immediately called back after speaking to Wayne and they're like, we want him at that elite camp in like two or three weeks. Went to the elite camp, um, just had a crack, seemed to go okay. And they just put me aside after it and they said, we want you to be a part of our under-19s Broncos squad. 
So I went back um, to my family, told them that they wanted me to be in the under-19s Broncos squad. And that's when we went to the Queensland... So I was with the Queensland Raw for soccer, which is there in the mm-hmm. A-League now. Mm-hmm. So I was... So at this point, I'm 16 years old and I'm in their reserve grade side, opens reserve grade side. So obviously, the first grade side went into A-League. So I'm, you know, on the path... 16, but in the twos. It, yeah, 16 yeah. reserve grade, which is like where all the state... the na- Play, people that make nationals and that, that's where you'd want to be. But even some guys that made Queensland weren't in that reserve grade side. Anyway, um, so I went to the Queensland Raw. They said, look, you'll play A-League in about two years, but obviously the choice is yours, whatever you want to do. Because I said the Broncos are interested. That's when AFL found out about it. Um, they found out about a kid that, you know, was had the ability to, I don't know, change sports or whatever. And they, the Brisbane Lions sat me down. Um, two scouts from the Brisbane Lions sat me down and said, look, if you... Come with us. We promise to train you full time for six months, fast track you to the draft, and give you the best crack at you know going at the draft and that. And at this point, my dad is like a diehard AFL fan, loves AFL, um, and so like it was hard because like I, like I wasn't super interested in AFL just because it's not big in in Queensland, but also like I, I just rugby league. Not that it was easier, but it was as long as you were physically and mentally tough, you can get like you can get through a lot in rugby league as long as you can get through the mental side of it. Um, and the, the Brisbane Broncos, it's like you know, what's the biggest AFL club? Collingwood, it's Richmond, like, yeah, Richmond or Collingwood coming to you in, as a six, seventeen-year-old saying, "We've got a contract for you here." Easy decision. And and yet AFL, you've got to go to the draft. So yeah. fuck, you know, you might not even get you might a millionth draft or whatever it is. Anyway, um, so it was. They're the biggest at that point. Like they've just won a bunch of premierships. Um, they're the they're actually the time that they signed me. They were the number one sporting brand in the country, regardless right. of sport. The Brisbane Broncos. Um, it wouldn't be like that now. I'd say it'd be an, I'd, I'd say it'd be like Collingwood or something like that now, or Richmond or whatever. Um, anyway, so it was it was a hard decision, but it was an easy decision because like the Broncos are already interested. I don't have to go into a draft. Like I'm already in that system. I was getting a bit over soccer, and also my brother had gone over to England um, and he had been offered a contract from Nottingham Forest for soccer. And so my plan was always to go over to England for soccer. But when he went over there, he got homesick and he came back, started studying uni and ended up becoming a doctor. But I'd kind of seen him do that. And I was like, well, if he's not over there, then I'm not like the plan was to go over there with him. So that was another like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe that's not the way to go. Anyway, so I decided the Broncos and uh, yeah, rocked up. A week before I rocked up, I didn't know how to tackle, so we got our old sprinting coach to get my brother to run straight at me and was teaching me how to tackle. And my brother doesn't know how to play footy either, so he's just getting... Well, he wasn't getting smashed because <laughs> yeah. I didn't know how to tackle. Um, and so I rocked up, and in the fir- when I ro- first rocked up, I was supposed to be with the under-19s. When I first rocked up, they're like, oh, actually, no, you're with our reserve grade side. We want you with our reserve grade squad. And the first session, we did like tackling on the pads and like, this is just warm up. Like, it's not hard. They've got diamonds on. It's not hard to ever. I did two tackles and I had to stop because my shoulders were cramping because <laughs> I had no muscles yeah. there. Um, and yeah, the rest was history. That brings back some really vivid memories for me. And this isn't to do with anything, but something that I've tried to block out of my brain was my <laughs> first pre-season session with the Giants in yep. Sydney. So obviously being a, you know, league dominated state, what the fuck do you do? You want to get better at tackling? Let's go get a league tackle coach in to come and teach us how to tackle. Mate, we used to do these two-hour sessions and we didn't even tackle each other. We used to put our foreheads against each other and it was like about strengthening your neck. Yeah. I got my, had migraines for six months. Like yeah. It was the worst thing I've ever done in my life. And yeah. then we'd get into the wrestling. Then we'd get into the, you know, sumo where you're pushing each other out yeah. of the square. You're doing this wrestling. You're doing this stuff. It, mate, NRL um, league, sorry, tackling – if you're not brought up with that, I don't think you can really get used to it too quickly. No, it's it was. I just uh, it, people always say like, "Oh, will you rattle? Will you this? Will you whatever?" But you know that young naivety and confidence where you just you just think you think you're invincible. Mm. And and it wasn't like I've, I'm sure there are some people when I was younger thought I was cocky, but I was never a guy that I was really, and I still am, I'm really confident in my own ability, but I feel like cockiness is when you're really confident in your own ability and you're bringing other someone else down. So yeah. it's like it's like saying, I'm really fucking confident, I'm fucking better than you. I think like that's cockiness, whereas confidence for me is like, I'm not sure what, what you are, 
but I'm fucking, I'm confident I can do what I can do kind of thing. And that's it's what also like. one part I absolutely love about that. It's, it's entitlement. Mm. And I spoke about this on a podcast with Chris Judd, who is one of the best players of all time. Mm. And he has a really interesting point on that. And it's so similar to that. And I've, it's changed my whole opinion on this mm. because in Australia, you know, you don't want to be cocky because it's, you know, not the right thing to do. Yeah. It's, it's seen as arrogant mm. and, and whatnot. But we, t- we spoke about entitlement and how bad entitlement is and you know people say you know these kids these days these millennials are so entitled they want things they want it now and mm. they want it ne- they want it right here it's like well it's actually not a bad thing to be entitled if you've done the work Absolutely. and if you believe in yourself mm. like if you've done what you've done and you've put in the work and you know if you've done this and you've built this whole company you should be entitled because mm. you've actually put the work in to to get to where you are absolutely entitlement's only bad when you haven't done the work and you mm. want to be somewhere where you're not yeah and I think it's it's where where the entitlement falls. Are you entitled before you have it, or entitled after you have it? That's a fine line because you nearly you nearly need to be entitled to get to be entitled. Yeah. If that makes sense, yeah, like, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Fake uh, it till you make it, sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, you need that that kind of like that naive confidence. Mm. Like even with starting the company, you know, if I looked at all the stress I'd have to go through before it, it'd be a much harder first step. Whereas like you have that naive to be like, I can do this, I can mm. do this. Um, but yeah, I, I do think there's a, a huge difference between um, working. Uh, we we used to call it in rug, uh, rugby league, earn the right, earn the right to say whatever you want to say, and that's why, like, for example, at the Broncos, we were like, it was one of the most toxic changing rooms ever in the sense of like, not toxic in a neg- negative way, but we had so many of the best players in the country that. Even if you were a rookie that had killed it, here's a perfect example. My debut um, at the time, I ran for the most meters of the modern era of rugby league for a debutant. Um, scored a 75 meter try that was like the second or third best try of the year. So it was like a, one of, one of the, a great debut. The first thing that they said to me when I walked off was, "You won't be playing first grade next week." Just so you know. And that sounds really mean and harsh, but it's all about like you haven't really done anything yet. You know, you've got one good game under your belt. That doesn't mean anything. Um, and so it, it's similar to the just because I played one good game doesn't mean I'm entitled to rock up rock up the next week and get that position and um, and yet a veteran can play a bad game but he's in if he's been playing for fucking 200 games he actually is entitled to that next game yeah and so I feel like the entitlement where it lands is really important if it lands at 200 games that's a little bit different. If it lands at fucking one or two games, I think um, that's an issue. But yeah, I, I've got no issue with someone being confident as anything. But as soon as they feel like they're owed something without having to earn it, that's when I'm like, you know what? Like, you just you you just you're so replaceable. Everyone's replaceable. Always. You, and I think that you know this isn't just league, AFL, NFL, anything. You know, one thing I was always big on with when I left footy was the fact that. I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Mm. It's not, you are not going to be missed. And I knew that straight away. Like I played 39 games at my first club. Do you really think that they're going to be fucking crying about me? Like when (laughs) I leave, like no one gives a shit. And I saw that, you know, it it actually hit me the most in my first year when, you know, it's your first year in a system, you're so used to the list and you're like, oh God, this is, it's going to be like us, us 44 forever, you know, like something fucking fantastic. Cut nine blokes. You're like, oh. It's going to be so different next year. A week goes into the next year, like, who the fuck are those blokes? I don't yeah. remember them anymore. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's just keeps Will keeps turning. Keeps turning. And I think that a lot of people, you know, we'll talk about transition later out of the game. But that's what I feel like in, in some sports, people leave sport and they think they're owed something. Mm. That sport's actually given you the platform to bounce off and do what you do next, you know, yep. like what you've done, you know, post your career now. Mm. Um, it might be a little bit different with, with league, but I feel like, especially in AFL, the support we get, you know, through the AFL Players Association and the AFL, I think it's set, we were chatting last week about this, I think it is set up a little bit better than league and the mm. support networks are there. But in footy, you are really given every chance to succeed. And it's like you want to go into a sport, yes, to have a good career, mm. you want to come out a better person as yeah, well. And absolutely. that was always my biggest thing. Um, you know, my father had, had just an incredible career um, in footy, but... I never wanted my sporting career to be like the highlight of my life. Mm. So I was always thinking like, fuck, what's next? You know, mm. I want I want my life to go like this on a trajectory, not like down, yeah. being like, fuck, mate, 
I didn't want to be that bloke in a bar per se. The, bloke the, in a bar. The negative one that's sitting in a bar oh, going. He's good too. He's, yeah, he's, he's a still a good guy. <laughs> he's still a good guy, but he's, you know, talking about, oh, you know, I could have done this, could have done that. Yeah. That's not what I ever wanted to be. Mm. Um, what's your views on that? How, I suppose, look, fast forwarding your career, because we had, you know, we, we spoke that you were with the Broncos. Um, and I wanted to touch on this a little bit later because I feel like it comes into the story of lessons learnt mm. in footy. Um, how did you transition out of the game? If you can give us a bit of a recap of the next, you know, period of time to then when you finished, what was that like for you? Yeah, it was, um, it was kind of like I quit and that was it. Like I didn't, um, I'm the thing is like, I'm sure if I reached out and asked for support, like there would have been support there. Mm. Um, but that's the tricky thing with these, these situations is that when your mental health isn't good, you're not going to reach out. Um, it's tough. You know, you can't expect... You can't expect these huge corporations to keep tabs on every single player that retires and they've, all they can really do is like set things up that so if you need help, it's there. Like it's, it's a really tough one. Like for, but there have been examples with footy, where, with rugby league, where the, the game hasn't reached out to certain big profile peach people and just said, you know, there was a commentator that had been commentating for like 27 years. He got the sack in COVID and like his um, company and the NRL didn't even reach out and just say, hey, mate, thanks for fucking, hope you're all good. Mm. Um, so in those situations, I think, you know, the game can be better. Uh, but, but in saying that, and I said it to him when he was on my podcast, I said, you know what, mate, like, I know that you're, you want those people to reach out, but at the end of the day, and this will be the same with AFL, AFL and NRL, they're actually not the game. The people are, Mm. the people are the game and the people said, thank you. And the people said they miss you. And I think, um, sometimes we get caught up thinking that, especially the NRL, like, in my specific case, like NRL is incredible. It's what it's done for me in my life is incredible. The opportunities I've been able to get, but NRL is not rugby league. Rugby league is the people. So I think when you start to realize that, um, you know, the people around you rather than a corporation are the people you've got to lean on rather than relying on some external thing that, you know, doesn't know that you're struggling or whatever. So yeah, there was real tough times after footy. Like I absolutely struggled, struggled with identifying like, my whole life I was an athlete from the, as soon as I could remember that I was thinking um, I was an athlete. And so disassociating from that identity was really tough. Like even even to this day, I still consider myself a footy player, mm. even though I'm not, haven't played in years. And so it's, it is really hard to come to grips with what is my purpose if the one thing I've been telling my whole life is the reason why I'm here. I'm put on this earth to be an athlete. Um, and so, yeah, it was really tough. I, I did a trade for about three years. I just because, you know, it's the right thing for a man to do is go out, get a job, make sure that you can support your future family or whatever. I did, had no passion for it, no interest in it whatsoever. I always had a passion for content, but man, this is like six six years ago or whatever. So to get the confidence to do it, then also my mental health with everything wasn't going so health wasn't going so good. Um, and then yeah, for a few years I was working um, in an above ground mine. Uh, and then I, then they moved us to a coal terminal. Um, but when I was working in the above ground mine, I was every day I would be saying to the other people, you know, the other workers around my age, um, there's got to be more to life, guys. There's fucking got to be more to life. I'm sure I did their heads in. Mm. But they were also feeling the same way because we would look at the older guys and some of them and, and all they did was complain and they weren't happy. And, and fair play to them, they were only there because they're trying to support their families. You know, the amount of men that I, I reckon are clinically depressed if you actually got them in with a therapist, but they sacrifice themselves because they know that's the only way their family is going to be fed. It's crazy. It's kind of like this, this untalked about sacrifice men mm. make, and I'm not comparing it to other sexes or whatever. I'm just saying like this specifically, like, you know, I know, everyone, I know every sex has got their problems. I'm not sitting here saying one's worse than the other. I'm just talking about my experiences with men. Um, and I just, we just always said, I don't want to be that man. I don't want to be walk, rocking up to work. Just, complaining and whinging like i've got to make a change but then i was like yeah but every young kid says that and then they have kids and then they get the weight of responsibility under their on their shoulders and so you say that at the start before you know it you're you're, you are them um and then i was also i would sit at work every day freezing so maroolan is in between canberra and sydney and because of the wind chill like this could be wrong might be an urban myth but because (laughs) of the wind chill it's the coldest place in the country because it's like apparently on top of some fucking like whatever the, the um, ranges or whatever. Anyways, because it's a wind chill, it's, it's freezing, bro. Like, so we had to use to work in full balaclavas, like triple layered up, gloves, glasses, everything, hard hats. Um, 
and and I remember sitting there like I would envy the older blokes that would rock up and when I would say to them like is there something like you know is there anything else you want to do they'd be like yeah you know just rock up do my job go home it's all good and I started like envying them because I was like I wish I wasn't thinking so much about everything I wish I wasn't sitting here going what about this what about that I wish I just like rocked up and yeah whatever content with wife life and so that's when I was like I got to do something or honestly I would, I would wake up and I'd sit at the end of my bed and go I hate this like there's got to be more to life be like four in the morning just like fuck there was never a second on my job where i was like this is enjoyable anyway um i saw so i was like i just want to do something i don't care if it doesn't work i just want to try just give it a crack and so it was actually 2012 where i initially wanted to make a youtube channel wish i had it now i would have been fucking loaded that's a long time ago. 2012 yeah. I was gonna, a video game channel imagine how big that's, that'd be you'd be like gary v talking about his wine channel bro a video game channel, 2012. In 2012, I was 18, and I, I don't th- think that anyone really was even doing YouTube or like in Australia. In don't Australia, get, you know, yeah. Ov- obviously, in other countries, they right. were. It would have been anyway, but I didn't have the guts. I like I fully set up the second room for it. I talked about it to my ex, 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 ex missus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's another podcast oh, in itself. Love, yeah. love, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's weird. It's like I've had so many ex missuses, but. You know, when I got to like 30, I'm like, man, I'm fucked. I'm so fucked. And then boom, just when I give up, when all hope is lost, I legit find the perfect chick. It's fucking mental. And it's her always. birthday today too. It is her birthday. Happy birthday, darling. I'm working on your birthday. I'm so shit. sorry. It's <laughs> my fault too. <laughs> I'm working on your birthday. Sorry, baby. I, <laughs> I know I'll take him out to dinner tonight. I'm not that bad of a bloke. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, I set up a second room. Actually, I haven't told anyone. I set up a second room and... I was going to use that as the studio for it. This is 2012 um, in Sydney and when I was living in Cogra. And and I I even got the graphics together. It was called uh, Drelo TV. And the the, 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 um, the line was more than a game. Um, and it was like an angry emoji face with like steam coming out his ears. So embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's got you to hear though, isn't it? I know. I reckon it's a cool slogan, more yeah, than a game. I like it. Um, Anyway, so yeah, I would like edit. I mean, please, I'm sure it's on private now, but I would edit like StarCraft videos together and everything. No one knew that I had this passion. Not even my missus. She didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. Um, And then so I just let it, you know, a quote that sticks with me and it's my favorite quote of all time. It's um, most men live lives of quiet desperation. And it's just like so what, what, true. What do you take out of that? Most men live lives. You have these dreams quiet. inside of you yeah. that just, you don't tell anyone, you don't. You don't put them out there. You're too you're too afraid to do them, yep. and also responsibility. Oh, that, you know what I mean? I feel I got goose like I seriously do get goosebumps with that because not trying to make this about me at all, but I think there's relatable. This is with mm. our relationship. There's so many different things and and same little nuances in in similar moments. But the other day, you know, I was I was talking about my vlog that I'm starting, and initially I was like, oh, you fucking loser, man. Why are you doing this? You know, you're such a loser. Mm. Like everyone's gonna think you are the biggest loser in the yep. world. And then I was like. Actually, I had this thought when I started the podcast mm. and I had the same thought and look, I'm here now. 100%. So I was like, every time I get that thought now, I go to it. Mm. I'm like, I've got to go to it. Mm. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think a lot of people and man, I'm not a philosopher. I don't have a degree in mental health. I don't have a, I fucking know nothing. Mm. All I know is what I've been through. Mm. And I look at my, uh, my story, you're li- listening to your story then, chatting to my friends about their story and there's a common theme that when you go through those moments, those crucible moments per se, that you know, you were working in the mines, doing uh, the apprenticeship, you look back on that and you think, fuck, without that, I wouldn't be where I am now. Absolutely. And I think that's why when I chat to people, and man, I'm not saying I'm in, I I always like to, you know, precursor this saying, I'm not where I want to be yet. You know, I want to be higher than where I am. Yes, I might go down, but I might go back up again. Mm. But take satisfaction out of sometimes being in a shit spot mm. because you know that something good's coming from it if you act on it. Absolutely. I, I, I'm always of the mind um, there actually is no mistakes. You know, whatever it is. Let's say, let's say you're a brickie and um, you go into content creation and content creation fails and you go back to being a brickie. Most people will take that as like, oh, I, I failed, I fucked up. But think of all the skills you learn as a content creator, you learn to edit, you learn what works, what doesn't work, you learn about lighting, you learn about videos, you learn about what to wear, what not to wear, um, you learn about how to upload things, you learn about how to upload podcasts, you learn how to um, 
put music in the right spots. So let's say you go back to uh, being a brickie. You're actually a better brickie than you were before because if you become your own brickie, you can have you, you do the marketing for free. You can take care of all the marketing because you know that now. So I, I, the same mindset, very similar. Um, and also I had the same the same doubts as well. Like, oh man, what are you doing? That like when Bloke and Bar really kicked off was when I fully put myself forward mm. and brought my personality in. Another quote that um, kind of backs up the last quote is, if you truly ask yourself, truly, what would you do if you couldn't fail? That's what you should be doing. Mm. What would you, because a lot of people, they'll, they'll balk at that. They'll be like, oh, oh well, I'd be, um, you know, maybe I would be CEO at my job or whatever. But you go, but if you truly couldn't fail, like let's say whatever you decided to do, you could be an astronaut, like tomorrow that's what you are. What would it be? You'd be surprised with some of the answers. They're so different to what the first answer is because mm. you actually sit down and think about like, okay, if I couldn't fail, like, and, and a lot of people just assume that they're going to fail, that there's just an assumption. Like, for example, I can't be a movie star, so I'm not even going to bother with it. Like, how many people out there want to be movie stars? Now, I'm, I'm not saying everyone can be that, but what I am saying is if you ask yourself that question and you be really honest with yourself, you'll be surprised at how far away the current field you're in is to the field that you want to be in. And now, don't get me wrong, I'm not... One of those, you know, fucking people on the internet, entrepreneurs of positive no, speak. Yeah. None of that nonsense. Because I understand that life throws responsibility on you. That Kids, jobs, that bills. That forces you down, down a line. But I just think that you've got to at least ask the question so that you're aware of, you know, okay, I am going down this route, but maybe I could, you know, just, just do a little bit of research into something that I, I might want to do or whatever. Um, and so every time I do stuff now, ev even now I still struggle with confidence. Like I'll be about to put a post up. It, I, I always struggle with confidence with posting and, and podcasting that whenever it's me putting myself out there. Yeah. Whenever it's like putting someone else's snip up, uh, snip it up or their episode, um, it's easy. I'm like, this is a great snippet, boom, straight up. Um, and so it just took, it, honestly, it took years for me to gather the confidence to go, you know what? Like, and this was before most people listen to podcasts. Um, yeah. To do it mate let's go back then i want to actually break it down in this context so 2015 was that when the locker room started yeah so the locker room was your first podcast that you did mm -hmm. um which in 2015 you know obviously that was god people know i'm not good at math so i stuff really fucked one up the other that's way six years ago that's six years ago that, that took me nearly six seconds to work out you know it might even be seven because like oh, the, fuck. I don't yeah know, let's just six. we might edit this um that took whatever time it was yeah we don't have to edit it. Let them have our <laughs> no, we, we won't Let edit them have it. Our we won't edit it. You want to spray us? It's all right. We, made <laughs> we love it. <laughs> um, uh, that was when that was really new. 2015. That mm. that you know that no one knew what a podcast was then. Um, you've come up with this idea. You're starting it. Talk us through the early journey of it, and then when did you start going? Fuck! I could be onto something here. Um, well, it was so even at the early phases, I was aware that the audience or community wasn't ready for podcasts yet. And so I focused more heavily on the snippets. Um, and if you wanted to listen to the podcast, it was there, but I didn't actually really push it. Again, this is confidence, you know, like who's gonna wanna listen to an hour long of me and someone else talking or whatever. Um, so the first few years, even though the podcast was there, there, there was no real push behind it. There was, um, it was more like, you know, four to five minute snippets. Well, initially I started like two minutes and then it grew to like three to four minutes. Um, and then it was, I did that, I was working full time um, in a coal terminal and doing the, that on the side for maybe a year, year and a half. And then uh, an advertising, so place, a place called Moneyball approached me because like it was so new in the space, there was no one else doing it, like literally no one else. So you actually got the attention quite uh, from a lot of people because uh, a lot of businesses, because they're looking for cheaper ways to get mm. in on a community. Anyway, so they contacted me and... Um, and yeah, they, they offered me enough money to be able to do it full time. And it was only like a three month contract. Like it wasn't like fucking a sure thing. It wasn't a lot of money either. Um, but I was like, and everyone was, I was like, I'm, that's it. I'm doing this full time. And I was in my third year of my apprenticeship. Every single person was like, and uh, that, uh, rightly so. Like they just been trying to be care about me. But they're like, don't finish your apprenticeship, <laughs> finish your apprenticeship. And I was literally like, I would rather die than keep doing this job. Like yeah. I genuinely, like I can't, keep doing this it is i'm so depressed i'm so fucking sad every morning like i can't keep doing this i don't care what i'll go pour beers at a bar if i have to like anyway so i quit my apprenticeship everyone said i was crazy um but even then like it wasn't 
it still wasn't a sure thing. Like it wasn't just like quit my job and then it was sweet. Like there was massive up and downs, even as late as like two years ago, you know, like we were sponsored by William Hill. They got it bought out by Bet Easy, and then it was real messy. Like, you know, the contract was there and technically, you know, we should still be working together, but you get bought out by a new company, the old stuff gets moved on. Um, and so, yeah, it was just like a, a slow burn. I guess it wasn't until probably two and a half, probably two years ago where I was like, you know, I want to take the next step to being an online sports network. Like I always had the plan to hopefully be an online sports network, but I just hadn't, I just needed to build that foundation, build that foundation. And then eventually I started um, doing like score updates, articles on people, funny stuff in rugby league, funny stuff in sport, MMA, uh, boxing, everything. And, um, and yeah, that kind of garnered a different type of audience. They didn't necessarily all listen to podcasts, but they were aware that, you know, I existed or whatever. It, it's really only been the last 12 and uh, probably 16 months where I've actually really pushed a podcast because I've felt um, that the community's ready for it. Like people know what podcast now. It's still tiny compared to what it's going to be, but I just feel like it's a lot more mainstream now. So, you know, you've got to decide where do you put your hours? Do you put it in short, sharp content that a lot of people understand or do you put it in the longer form content um, or do you split it between the two? So for a few years, it was in the short, sharp content. Um, now, and then for, then for the last, you know, 16 months, it's been short, sharp content, but also podcast. Um, and now we've, I've obviously got help. So that, that helps me with the longer form stuff. One thing I picked up on that I love that you said then about when you're working and you're nearly finishing your um, apprenticeship, Mm. Be like, fuck this, I can't do it anymore. I've mm. got to quit. And you quit. One thing I think that I've learned through this whole period. Now, when I finished footy, I didn't choose to quit. Okay, it wasn't my decision. Got sacked. Mm. But it was, I was going to anyway, if mm. that didn't happen. Okay, I wasn't going to retire. I was going to quit. Um, just because I was like, this isn't for me anymore. I'm so fucking unhappy. Mm. You know, even in a sport like that, I was like, I just can't do this. It's not me. Mm. But I think a, a big thing with some people as well sometimes, and again, we're not trying to give life lessons, but sometimes you have to put yourself under that pressure, mm. you know, of like not having something. Absolutely. And you would have been like, fuck, I'm all in now. Yeah, absolutely. Like I actually can't not fuck up. Yeah. Like, and it was the same thing for me when I finished. I was, I went into doing radio and I was learning that and I was like, this is shit. Like I really hated it. Like mm. I was really, really done. But I was yeah. like, I can't quit yet because I need to do this. And I was like, you know what? I'm living at home with my uh, Mrs. Parents, mm. my bills are at a minimum. I've cut down everything. You know, I sold my, you know, my car. I got rid of my car, got rid of everything. So I had no loans. Mm. So I was like, no matter what, I knew what I had to get by a month. Mm. And I was like, I'm going to go fucking just do this yep. because I need to. So there is ways, you know, I'm not saying if you've got three kids, you can do it, but yeah. it is one of those things. You put yourself under the pressure to get to where you are. And that's mm. why you've probably done what you've done. Yeah. I, and I also think that sporting confidence that you get from playing sport your whole life of like, just having a crack yeah. just just fucking take that step um i think that also you've got to you've got to be honest with yourself of you know if you're young and you don't have kids you should be trying anything you can you know like try anything you can just ha just have a crack just just because you've got the ability to do it that's where i, I feel not sorry because obviously they got kids it's a beautiful life mm -hmm. or whatever but it decisions become much harder when you have a, a wife and children or whatever or a husband and children to make these calls so like if you are thinking about doing x or y um do exactly what you did sit down and be like okay get all rid of all your loans if you can and just just have a crack like just you'd be surprised at how much opportunity is out there if you just put yourself in a position to do it so mate you've ticked the locker room you've built up the community at bloke in a bar which mm -hmm. is talk us through how big that is just at the moment you've got the facebook page you've got the podcast like it's it's a big network yeah so i think we've got about one hundred eighty-five thousand followers on the facebook page um about one hundred fifty-four thousand followers on instagram um and then with the uh with the podcast we get about three hundred ten thousand downloads a month um how many episodes do you do a week two, two a week but that's just gone up to um Two a week, but that's just gone up to like, you know, four or five. But we were, we, the, the last month where it was two a week, it was 300, 300, about 310,000 downloads. Um, 
obviously it's going to increase dramatically mm. you know with these because we sure. we've got the f- uh, the beers and footy which is us watching footy um then we've got the locker room where well, i sit down with a the guest then we've got a preview and review so basically like we'll move into the territory of a network like if you you can just come to us and you get all your footy content obviously people will consume but that's another thing it's like i used to think oh man i can only put out one podcast a week now people are like mate need more like i've got the, you know i want to sit through i want to have something each day to be able to sit through while i go to the gym or whatever um and so yeah it's just going to be so interesting to see where yourself and and, and i go over the next you know it's, it's just the beginning bro imagine in 10 years you know mm. Fuck. it's weird man it's 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 awesome to think and it's such a it just and that's why i love working with you because it's just like you get that motivation and mm. just sort of the it just spurs me on to go even harder with it yeah. because the things that you're doing that I'm just learning from so much, like your, your beers and footy. And, you know, we look at, we always talk about people from the US, you know, like these Barstool Sports, mm. you know, Dave Portnoy and, yep. and these guys that have just been, you know, killing content mm. um, worldwide. One thing that is evident as well with, with your story, and it's a little bit different to where it's out in Victoria, is this sort of, I don't wanna say, I don't wanna say divide, but it's something that's different between uh, commercial media and podcasting media in the NRL. Mm. And it's it's almost like from an outside perspective, it's like this loyalty to look after, you, you know, your mate sort of thing, but also because a commercial media looks to sort of maybe report the bad stories of players. Like mm. it's getting to the stage now where a lot of players are actually, instead of doing the, the, the feature with the Channel 7 or the mm. feature with the Herald Sun or whatever it's called up here, they are actually coming to, you know, podcasting and stuff. Mm. And I'm starting to find that now with players too. They're saying, hey, like, I've got a story, mate. I want to come tell it to you rather than someone else. Yep. No, absolutely. I think it's a, a worldwide kind of thing. I just think that, you know, the problem is with mainstream media is 85% or 90, whatever the percentage is, is just normal people trying to do their best. You know, it's just that it's that negative 10% where, you know, one day they're your best mate. The next day they're writing a shocking article that they know is not true or half true. They take a half truth and do this, that. And I just think that a lot of people, are, um, especially players, they just want to get the power back. You mm. know, for so many years, the power has been out of their hands as to who they are portrayed as a person. And I think the beautiful thing about social media and podcast is that that power is back in the power, player's hands. So, look, mainstream media still has its place and... They do a lot of good stuff too, you know. So I do feel like some of the journalists get painted with the same brush. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's a player's right to decide how he is portrayed in the sense of like, no longer does he have to rely on someone else to put across who he is. There's no longer a middleman that can change things to an extreme because their business model is different. The, the hard thing for a lot of media companies as well is like their business model is based on clicks and views. So they have to go extreme in whatever they do. Big, big part of Bloke in a Bar now is the beer. Mm. Talk me through that journey. You've got this media company, you're building this media empire, this network. Where was where did it decide to go? Actually, hey, let's create a beer out of this as well. Um, it was always um, the plan to have my own products. So the, the issue I saw at the start of podcasting, the biggest issue for any media company and also the biggest issue for any company that sells a retail product, it's twofold. Like, the biggest issue for any company that sells a retail product is marketing. It's the cost of marketing and getting your brand out there. It is astronomical. Mm-hmm. Like you would be blown away by the amount of money some huge, like big companies pay just to keep something in your face all the time. It's not even about the quality of the ad. It's just like, we just need you to keep seeing it. Yep. Um, so that's the, the, any startup that is in the retail business, that's their biggest issue is may, making people aware of um, their brand. So I was always like, what if I had a comp- company that owned its own network and it was zero dollars to market. And then on the flip side, I was like with the podcast, the biggest issue with podcasting, and you'd know this, is having to rely on sponsorship. Week in, week out, you know, you, you could go, go on a hot run and all these sponsors are keen on you for six months. Mm. And then six months is like a dry spell. And you yeah. can go to them and go like, look, I can guarantee to sell you heaps. You'll get your money back. And still the, the wheels turn so slowly that they're just like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll have a look at it. And like a few months go by, nothing happens. And so you're aware that like getting sponsors on podcast is still extremely tough. And not only that, but the, these media networks now as well, like podcasting platforms, they're taking 50%. Mm. 
that's what you know a lot of these platforms do is they will bring you through they offer you money you think fuck that's a good deal i'll sign yep. this yep. not realizing that they're actually taking all the money yeah and they're just using you as a you know you're getting a little bit on the side yeah it's like um yeah i, I don't even I, i'm sure there is a place for them um but if i any advice to podcasters coming through like take care of your own stuff you don't you're going to get better deals going to businesses yourself because they're going to see you as a person um you know yeah you're just not gonna so so the biggest issue with podcasting is is the the money you know like getting a regular income for a 12 month period that that's a you ask any podcaster when i started i was like look if you can pay me 80k a year guarantee each year i would be content for the rest of my life to do this and that's and, and you know the the beautiful thing is we've managed to exceed that with the beer and that's great but if someone said to me and i'm sure you're the same like if someone said to me 80k a year guarantee for the next 50 years um and you get to do this podcast i would be like life mate happy man happy as fucking anything i get to do something i have a huge passion for i don't i'm not a person that needs like i don't even like i lend my car to my employee i fucking ride those line bikes on the side <laughs> of the road like so i'm not a guy that you know gets a lot of enjoyment out of materialistic things what i do get a lot of enjoyment out is seeing a positive change in the sporting community um anyway so I always thought like I never want to have to rely on sponsors. So if I have my own products, then and they're selling well, I kill two birds with one stone. Mm. And so that's where the, the beer came in. I was like, what would be the perfect perfect thing for the demographic that listens to our? The be- the beautiful thing about what we've got set up is we had the, the customers before the product. The product, yeah. So we can create the product for the customer. Um, and also like our tail of marketing, it can go we have no end it's zero dollars essentially um whereas a lot of the beer companies like eventually the, let's say they have a 70 million dollar spend at the end of that 70 million dollar spend whatever people they've retained that's what they got that's okay so let's say 70 million dollars bought 100 million dollars worth of customers spending wise or whatever but then also how do you keep them long term you know you've got to keep spending money eventually um to keep them so it's just this like never-ending cycle of spending money to to get customers whereas if you've got your own community that you're trying to build and give something good to um you keep them with the quality content you know so that was kind of the the brains behind uh the the beer and the process of this like i wouldn't have you know, i'm not just saying this and and you know before we partnered up it was one of my biggest things you know we're saying we want to get a dylan friends beer with bloke lager i was like well, fuck, i've got to try these because yeah. i i do like drinking beer mm. It is. I'm not just saying this because it is a partnership, but they are a beautiful drop, mate. Yeah. It how is, how yeah, did you like? What's the process of doing something like this? So we got one of the best young brewers in the country. He speaks at Gab's festivals. He's the head brewer at a certain brewery that's you know really well respected. Um, and was blind taste testing. So he came with the initial recipe, like just small brew, and we got all its competitors, and we got five blokes and two chicks or, or one um, girl, woman, and. We poured out a beer each time in front of them. They didn't know what it was. They would sip it. They would write what they thought out of 10 and then comments, smooth, crisp, bitter, um, fruity, whatever. And so we just kept, like we would get our results initially and then we would take it back, we'd change the recipe, bring it back, see if it got better. Take, and we did that four times. And even before, the last time, before I'd even put it in front of them, I sipped it and I was like, that's it. But the last time he got the best ratings out of 10 overall and it got exactly what we wanted, which was smooth, crisp, easy drinking. And that's how you come with the recipe. Yeah, it's super crispy. <laughs> I do, uh, no, it's, it's, it's something that, um, yeah, like I was always, you know, I love drinking beer. Um, and I don't say that like I have always liked it. You know, when like you first get into drinking when you're a kid, I'd always like, Grab beers, but oh, they are so good. Like, I hated, hated them. I hated, hated them, man. I, <laughs> I hated so, them so much. I was a vodka double smirn off <laughs> the red net. Remember that? <laughs> I just copped the beer. I was like, you know what? I hate all alcohol. If I'm going to like get into it, mm. I'm going to just drink the beer because it'll be the worst thing. Mm. But um, no, nah, it, it is a it is a ripper, mate. What's the plans with the beer to come? Is there going to be more in the range? Like, you're going to bring more out yeah, eventually? eventually? Is that we'll the goal? Mid strength. Um, you know, but we just got we have got the bottles to do still. Yeah. We've got the mid strength that we want to do. What's bring this, out what's the bottle gonna be like? Can you let um, us well, we've got the design. It's gonna be a clear bottle. Is it thin? Um yeah, yeah, just like a normal standard. Normal standard. Yeah. Um and it'll be a clear bottle and basically like a bloke down the side, but just I just want to give the feeling of freshness, you mm. know, like summery vibe kind of thing. But it, the bottle will obviously be the same flavour as this this lager. Um and then we've got a mid strength and they've got the mid strength um uh got the mid strength bottle and then also we're going to do we do limited edition stuff as well we mm. got um 
a partnership coming up with a big um, page that's going to be sick. But also, like, during Origin, um, State of Origin for Rugby League, we release, like, limited edition New South Wales, Queensland cans. Um, and so we're going to do cool stuff like that. So, for example, we could do something with... We should friends. do a Victorian one. We could. We could. We will. We will. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, for example, a Dylan Friends one. Like, let's fucking look into it, 100%. 100%, yeah. Um, it, it, bro, we just keep the same, the same flavour. It's a fucking great beer. Um, and I reckon we could make a mad Dylan Friends one, make the can like white or something, and, and like the blue little face on the front. Even with the, you know, on that? that's uh, that's me actually. Oh, that's okay, a, sorry, it's a, it's a male. Yeah, ah. yeah. <laughs> I thought I was a little girl. No, well, yeah, there's a lot of people <laughs> think that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, with the business side of things, I suppose, mm. like you look at your sporting career, you look at the the media, the beer to come. Realistically, that's like a business. Okay, mm. obviously it is. <laughs> literally and figuratively literally <laughs> and think about it it actually is okay <laughs> how much do you actually think about that now looking mm. back from like the the triumphs and the hardships of your sporting career mm. has helped with the business stuff now um i mean yeah obviously i think i think sports such a a good way to teach a young person male or female about hardship about loss about working towards something about working towards something as a team, about understanding that sometimes you can work as hard as you want and you still can lose, um, about the reward of how good it feels to work hard and, and receive something. Um, but to be honest, I think I learned the most from my dad. You know, my dad was, he was just a grinder. Like he yeah. always just, he always said to me, just, just keep turning up, just keep turning up. It's that simple, just turn up, everything else will take care of itself. And it seems like such obvious advice, but Think about in, in your own life, like how many times have you gone, yeah, fuck it, not, not going to do this or I'm going to take a day off or whatever. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, some people, you know, you do need a day off. But for example, like Bloke in a Bar, that hasn't missed a day of posting in like three years. Um, and even, even Bloke in a Bar's story is never empty, ever. It's never been empty. Um, and so just things like, they're the, they're the little things about consistency and just like no matter what, even, no matter how bad it gets, the best thing to do is just keep turning up because you just you grind it back. You grind the wind back. You just grind. You, even if someone comes out with short term better content than you, you just beat them in the long run. Yeah. You just like every time, you know, someone's like, "Oh, you see this or that," and you know, they're going whatever. I'm like, "Yeah, mad." Like I'm happy for them. I'm stoked because I'm I'm of a um, of the mind that there's plenty to eat for people. There's so much room. There's no need for a competition. But when someone does say like, "Oh, are you worried about this or that?" I'm just saying, look. If they can outwork me for the next 20 years, fair play to them. Yep. Um, but I'm going to be here for the next 10, 20 years working. Unless I fucking ride off into the sunset and turn into like a hermit or something. <laughs> See me in five years, I've got a big beard. I can get in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it is true though, man. Like I think like, exactly like you said, I, I really respect and I, I get that with the, the competition. Not mm. competition, but you know, like people starting things. And I always, you know, I've always got one eye on the competition. Mm. And that Absolutely. was with yourself. Like I was always seeing your stuff and being like, fuck. Fuck this guy. You know, I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, fuck 100%. this guy. Who is this bloke? I know. But then I was like, well, I can actually reach out and learn something here yeah, from him yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's like you've got to just back yourself in more that you're going to be able to trump that other than 100%. worry about something else. Because if you worry about it, it probably will happen. It, if you sit there worrying about it, A, you're bringing in negative thoughts into your head. There's like this negative thought of like, man, you know, I, I need to beat him. I need to beat him. But if you're just like... For example, even like goals and targets. I know that most businesses do goals and targets and I know that like they're very important. But for me personally, like I didn't even look at goals and targets because I'm like, I'm just going to go hard every day mm. and the goals, whatever they are, they're going to be, as long as I know and have been honest with myself that I'm going hard every day, they're, they're whatever they, I can't do anything more than that. Yeah. Um, but also like competition is good. Like I think... I don't know if it's this day and age or whatever. I, I know, uh, like, I always never, I never want to be the old guy that's like, you know, back in my day or whatever. I'm not, so I'm not, I don't know if that is the case these days, but I feel like there was a, there's been this kind of turn for competition is negative. Like, it's seen as a, uh, you, you, you can't compete with someone, but still be mates with them. You've mm. got to hate them or something. Yeah. Um, you know, like, we, we joke all the time, like, with the spot of, Spotify thing, um, you know, going one and two, like that's a competition. Tell, yeah. But if you win, I'm like, fuck, good on you. It's whereas I just think that there's been a, some kind of with the extreme nature of the internet, where we just seem to like the loudest voice gets recognised. Yeah. It's the same with comp. It's like it, this, this, this. Um, it's been like so. 
it's muddied the waters of competition where you ha- you have to hate someone to compete against them. When when I was, you know, I, I know this is saying back in my day, but I was always taught competing against someone at the hardest you can compete and the hardest they can compete is one of the most honourable things you can do because it's like me and you against each other, we go as hard as we can and then we shake hands at the end of it. That mm. was that was what I was always taught as one of the most honourable things you can do because it's two men or women having a crack and then in the you earn the respect of each other in that battle and then you shake hands at the end of it. And I just, I don't know, I, I, I feel like a lot of younger kids seem to think that you have to hate the enemy to defeat them or be defeated by them. Yeah. Um, but it, it just, I, I think the ultra competitive people, the people at the top, um, other than like Michael Jordan and that, which is a fucking sociopath, but that's why we're so great. Yep. Um, you never, put it this way, you never see a successful person being a hater. No. Ever. Well, you don't want to have that, if you've got that thought coming to your brain mm. at the first thought, you got to wipe that. Because I had that. Yep. I 100% had that. Yep. We're, we're chatting about this, you know, off podcast. But yep. even when I was playing footy, you know, I'd, I'd, you know, and I hate to even admit this, but I'd hate seeing my teammates go well because mm. I was like, fuck, well, you know, if he goes well, I'm not going to play. Mm. But then it fucking finally worked out and I was like, well, do I really want him to be playing shit and then me come in and fix his spot or do Absolutely. I want to be at my best and mm. him be at his best and then me beat him? Yep. And that, totally. that was when I was like, fuck. That's the purest thing you too. You know, I was like, that. I'm not really earning it if he's shit and like yep. he's in a... It's it's different. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was when I realised with that, I was like, competition is so healthy, but so just hope everyone's at the best because you, if, if they're not and you are, then it's like you're not really winning anyway. Absolutely. And as soon as they hit their form again, you're yeah, you're out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think com- I think competition is really healthy. I think that a lot of young kids should be trying to get as competitive, like not as competitive as they can be, but being taught how to win and lose, win and lose. You're not going to win every battle. You no, just man, not. I've lost... I, I fucking lost so many myself, you know? I lose all the time. Like, at the end of the day, I'm just some fuckwit having a crack. Yeah, that's, that's what it... No, honestly, really you are. Is. And I'll, I'll emphasize fuckwit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you didn't need to. <laughs> you didn't need to, but you did. You did. So there it is. It's on the table in between us. We're going to have a naked wrestle after this. <laughs> oh, I look forward to that. <laughs> um, mate, just quickly last bit on this. Getting involved with... with this is something that I actually really sort of forgot to ask you before we mm. even got a partnership but how did you lost in my eyes or yeah how did my we, nose in your fucking <laughs> yeah face. i think it was your nose <laughs> how did you get involved like what did you see i suppose in dylan friends and bloke in a bar like well, how did you say that transpired did you do your research did you ask people about me like mm. obviously you didn't wouldn't have known me from a bar of soap we're in mm. different states total different people mm. what was the process like um you know i've always wanted a little brother I like, that's so, actually really nice. Yeah, I just wanted a little brother. I'd be like, you know, good on you. Well done. <laughs> uh, and pink like, eyes. Because like, my brother, he's the older brother. I yeah. don't have a little brother. Yeah. It's like hug you and like when you're crying <laughs> and upset. <laughs> and you're all upset and shit because you're getting bashed and that. I just want to be there for you. Um, and and it seemed to work out perfectly because you have. are my little brother. Thank you. Maybe even my son. That actually is really nice. <laughs> yeah, actually, that was a beautiful right. answer. Um, no, to be honest, I, I just, you know, obviously I, I'm a pretty good judge of character like and that's one thing i've been pretty successful at is is a judge of character like i can see someone speak for a few minutes and usually i can just for some reason i just get a a good feeling or bad feeling from them and i just i saw that you were putting up the numbers so that wasn't that i didn't need to see that um i just wanted to see you as a human being like do you have the same um values as i do and i and i just assumed you did and i watched more and more and i just saw the way you carried yourself with your guests your vulnerability but also um your drive like a lot of people can mistake being vulnerable with being weak but you were actually strong enough to be vulnerable which it's actually a strength like being vulnerable in certain scenarios it's actually much harder to do that than it is to not be vulnerable um and i i loved the fact that you were you had this really good work ethic and crazy drive but you were also you had these principles of based around positivity, you know, honest, be a good bloke, try to get good messages out there, try to help other people, um, help the community. And I just, just related immediately. I just thought that's exactly what I'm trying to do. And so that's what drew me to Dylan friends. Also, like I messaged a few people in the AFL community and I just was like, what's, um, <laughs> you know, I just, just, just my, my, my informants, <laughs> yeah. like two or three of them. Um, but yeah, and they all come back with positive things. So Honestly, it was just I saw that you were a good person. Really, that's that's the the mate. If you could have the same numbers, and if you were a shit bloke, um, you know there were a certain 
they were like we didn't just look in AFL, or not we. I didn't just look in AFL. I looked in other areas, and there were certain people that you could argue had bigger this or that. Um, but with you, I just looked at someone that's like a good person, and I want to be a part of my brand because I'm looking to build. I'm looking to change the sporting community in Australia. Period for the better, long term. Um, and I think you're the man that can do that. I appreciate it, man. And I echo the exact uh, back to you, my friend. You've you. We've got a similar story, same passion. We're passionate about talent, you know, storytelling, mm. getting the best out of people, um, listening, you know, you're empathetic, but also you love having fun. Mm. And that was a big thing, you know, I, I think that I'm still so early in my journey, but sometimes I'm like, I don't want to focus so much on this, but I still want people to know like, hey, at the end of the day, let's fucking have some fun. Absolutely. Because like, you've got to have fun, man. Like, you know, we can talk and I love talking about positive messages but at the end of the day like you can talk about everything but if you don't go out and have fun that's you're not going to be using anything yeah, and, and i think that's why i love our partnership with you know with the beer with the the same network the storytelling the podcast and the vodcast and the live streaming um you're just a fucking go-getter mm. you are seriously a go-getter if someone said to me what's dan and kemp like i'd be like dan and kemp is the sort of guy that like wakes up and he's like has an idea and he just fucking does it mm. and that's like what i want to be mm. so um mate i'm so excited for what's next for us i hope you've enjoyed coming on the podcast mate, as a guest podcast of my life thank you, you might be better than me might i am <laughs> well done my friend no honestly it's it's been it's been a pleasure and i seriously like for 90 percent of that forgot we were even um i know on the show i'll I tell you what um i don't want to break the news but we're going to do something together we'll we do are. a podcast together we've yeah, already got the idea we have we're not telling it though yet no no no, no. Way. you know what we could because i don't think anyone could do it anyway no, but uh, it's a fucking great idea yeah it is let's 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 fully form it yeah and then and then um release it to the people i reckon last question for the pod what's next for dan and kemp bloke in a bar um basically you know i i want Obviously, your AFL, you know, I, I do a bit of rugby league, but I want to, it, with our partnership, I want to give you the resources to be as big as you can be. And I want you, because I believe that you're going to positively impact AFL. Um, and so in 12 months' time, I want us both to be seen as not the fi- as, as big players in the game when it comes to sporting content um, in, in both of our respective sports. I know you're going to lean heavily into a lot of sports, mm. um, but yeah, for t- the, in the next 12 months, I want people to look at Bloke and Bar the same way they look at Fox Sports as a network. And not necessarily, we don't do the same kind of content. We have a different kind of, I guess, thesis around what we're going to do. But yeah, when people switch on their, you know, go to, they, they've got a decision. They're going to turn on Fox Sports or Channel 9 or they go, when they mention networks, they go Fox Sports, 9, Bloke and Bar. That's, that's kind of the, the goal over the next 12 months is really to be seen as a positive sports network um, that's a genuine option for the sports community to come to and consume quality content that's going to bring happiness and positivity into everyone's lives. It's awesome, man. I can already see it happening. Last thing as well, I was just thinking, if anyone in Victoria or even throughout the state wants bloke in a bar in their pub or their mm. bottle of anything like that, how can is it possible? How can we work Absolutely. that out? Absolutely. Yeah. So we're in a thing called ALM in, in Victoria. Yeah. Uh, we also, you could do it um, straight through Dennis at blokeinabar.com. So oh, not just, Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> not Dennis. He's, uh, he's the guy. He's the guy <laughs> you speak to, my employee. Um, he's a character. Dennis he's said a, that you're, he's, you're his employee. He, did he say that? Yeah. That's something Dennis would say. It would be wrong, but that's what he said. <laughs> um, just like you said you were a better podcaster. You know, yeah, people okay, say yeah. stupid shit. Yep. yep. Um, <laughs> um, so Dennis at blokeinabar.com, email him and he can sort out you getting um, bloke in a bar either a keg or cases to your um, bottle shop. But, you know, as you know, you being based in Victoria, we're, we're really big Queensland, New South Wales, and we're going to make a big push into Victoria. So get the beer on board because it's a quality beer. It is, man. Thanks so much. Boom. If you want to try a bloke in a bar, head to the website at www.blokeinabar.com to find your local retailer. 